Lene Danielle Westbrook was born on January 31, 1979, to parents Dave and Barb. She was described as bubbly with a beautiful smile and loved to laugh and treated others with respect. At the age of 41, Lene lived in Anacortes, Washington, located on the north shore of Fidalgo Island in the state's Puget Sound. Things hadn't gone the way she had planned for her life, and she began drinking more. She was living with her beloved and cherished rat terrier named Precious in the San Juan Motel. She was casually dating two different men, Mike and Sean, and working at a nearby Safeway store that was in walking distance. On September 10, 2020, she was seen leaving home with a man in a white single-cab Dodge Ram pickup truck around 7 p.m., Soon after, she was again seen on security footage at the Swinomish Market at the casino, and then the two went to the nearby Thousand Trails campground. This was the last time Lene or her dog Precious was seen. A few days later, her family was not yet aware that Lene was missing until her rent was overdue and a call was made to her mother to retrieve her items from her motel room or the rent be paid. Her mother then learned that Lene had not been showing up for work, which was something she had never done before, and immediately reported her missing. Initially, Mike and Sean were questioned as they were men she had been dating. Mike had allegedly hit Lene at least once, and police were called. Strangely, the day she went missing, Mike left town and changed his Facebook picture to a picture of he and Lene with a caption, No woman, no cry but he had actually left earlier on the day that she was last seen to go work on a boat in Alaska and therefore had a solid alibi despite the strange social media comment. So the investigation then turned toward Sean, but he also had a solid alibi as he was in jail when Lene went missing. Therefore, the investigation then focused on Jeff, the driver of the white pickup truck, and the person last known to see her alive, and a man with many felonies under his belt related to drugs, sexual assaults, domestic violence, and many other violent occurrences. Later, Jeff claims they went to the nearby campground where he had been staying in an RV. He said he last saw her when he dropped her and her dog off about 2 or 3 a.m. at Costland Memorial Park, located about two blocks from the San Juan Motel where she was living. Many speculate this story is untrue. Also, he allegedly told her family two different stories as to the reason he didn't drop her off at the motel. One claim was that it was because he didn't want to run into her boyfriend, Mike, and the other claim was that Lene wanted to walk Precious. But the hotel manager said Lene didn't walk her dog. Instead, he had a certain spot in the grass at the motel where he always used the bathroom. Further information came out after she went missing that points to foul play happening at the campground. People who were at the campground on the night she disappeared reported hearing a man and woman arguing, likely intoxicated, coming from the direction of Jeff's RV. They reported the woman was angry and yelling for her dog Precious, and the man was screaming at the woman, threatening her if she didn't shut up, followed by the sound of the woman's screams being muffled by the man. A park ranger was notified of the incident, and by the time he arrived to the RV, Everything was quiet, and he could see two people inside who were no longer fighting and assumed the situation was resolved and left. The campground where they were at that night is where many believe Lene was murdered following an argument and is actually a reservation where he was living in an RV. The fact that it is a reservation changes the jurisdiction for who is in control of the investigation regarding the campground. Her family is frustrated that it took law enforcement nearly three weeks to look at Jeff. He refused to allow law enforcement to search his RV, and there was apparently not enough evidence for a warrant at the time, and as of July 2022, Lene remains missing, and this case remains unsolved. Julia Potter was born on December 18, 2007, to parents Jason and Relista Potter. On November 6, 2014, 
Seven-year-old Julia was kidnapped by Jason from Seattle, Washington after he lost a custody battle and being told to deliver her to the local police department. That same day prior to her disappearance, Relista was granted primary custody following a very bitter custody battle and restraining orders were given protecting her and Julia from his alleged destructive and abusive behavior. She claims that he spent several years brainwashing Julia along with the therapist he was secretly taking her to. He also allegedly filed a restraining order against Relista years before her daughter's abduction, and he had made 21 different reports to the CPS, accusing her of abuse which she claimed was false. Relista claims that Jason's mother, stepfather, and two sisters have aided and abetted him in his journey to keep Julia from her mother. For the past eight years, law enforcement, including the FBI, have been unable to locate the father and daughter. He had reportedly mentioned to his lawyer that he would be going off the grid. He is currently still wanted on felony kidnapping charges, and his date of birth is September 16, 1969. He has ties to Tacoma, Bellingham, Seattle, and Olympia, Washington. Relista continues to search for her daughter, reaching out through social media and utilizing a private investigator. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children created an age-progressed photo of what Julia may have looked like at the age of nine. There is currently a $100,000 reward for credible information that would lead to the discovery of Julia. As of July 2022, Julia would be 14 years old, but she has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Lenoria Elise Ann Jones was born on January 3, 1992, in Spokane, Washington, and later lived in Tacoma, Washington, in the notorious Hilltop neighborhood. At birth, she tested positive for cocaine, and so her mother had to place her in the care of relatives in Spokane, as the father was unknown. Her mother was also in the process of being jailed for transporting cocaine. Lenoria bounced from one relative to another, ultimately having six different homes, until the age of three. At that point, her mother's rights were terminated, and her great-aunt, Berlene Williams, a mother of four, was in the process of adopting Lenoria, who was already living with Williams, and her two adult daughters. Her birth mother was living in Arkansas, but would often call and speak with her daughter. On July 20, 1995, 45-year-old Williams and Lenoria left to run some errands. The two went to a car wash at 8 a.m. at South 12th Street and South Sprague Avenue. They then made a stop at a convenience store at 6th Avenue and Outer Street before stopping into a Top Foods grocery store and then finally arrived at Target sometime after 9 a.m. Soon after, Williams called 911 to calmly report Lenoria missing. She initially told authorities that Lenoria disappeared inside the Target store on South 23rd Street in Tacoma. When investigators reviewed the video's surveillance footage, searching for footage of Lenoria, they discovered something else instead. The footage showed Williams entering the store alone and Lenoria was nowhere in sight. They also discovered that she had called her daughter to say she couldn't find Lenoria one hour before ever calling police, but could not explain why she waited so long to call police. Over the next couple weeks, Williams changed her statements to authorities several times after learning of the store's videotape. She then claimed that Lenoria was taken from the Target parking lot and also said she wandered away from her home and that two unidentified African-American men had kidnapped her from an alley behind her home in the 1900 block of South Sheridan Avenue. At one point, she claimed that she was safe and living somewhere but wouldn't say where. Lenoria's mother says she called Williams and asked to speak to Lenoria two days prior to her disappearance, but was not allowed to talk to her. Authorities placed Williams under house arrest for four months after for failure to provide information. Because Lenoria was technically a ward of the state at the time of her disappearance, Williams was found in contempt of court. Her license for her daycare, God's Wonderful World of Colors that she ran out of her home was also suspended. 
To this day, Williams has never been charged in connection with Lenoria's disappearance and has never reportedly been accused of any type of neglect or abuse in the past. Many speculate that an accident occurred resulting in Lenoria's death and Williams did not feel safe reporting it to law enforcement or trust them and instead covered it up. Because Williams' custody of Lenoria was being contested at the time of her disappearance, it was theorized that a disgruntled family member may have taken matters into their own hands. Police also looked into her birth mother and was initially told that she was living in Texas, but it was later discovered that she was actually living in Star City, Arkansas. The FBI searched her home but couldn't find any trace of Lenoria and interviewed her friends and family in the area. Her grandparents living in Spokane, who had requested custody of Lenoria in the past, were also investigated and ruled out as being involved. The FBI reported that they had no reason to believe that her disappearance had anything to do with a custody dispute. Police then speculated that Lenoria could have had an accidental overdose of her ADHD medication. She had just been prescribed Norpramin a few days earlier, now known as Decipramine. Decipramine is an antidepressant used to treat the symptoms of ADHD and behavioral issues. Lenoria was diagnosed with ADHD much earlier in life than what is typical because of her mother's cocaine use in utero. At the time, the drug was experimental and is now recommended for adults only as it can be toxic to children. This led to speculation that she was given too much or got into the bottle which somehow led to her death and Williams panicked and lied about her going missing. Her lawyer maintains that her differing accounts of Lenoria's whereabouts were due to the badgering that she had received from law enforcement and the long hours of interrogation. She said she was pressured into coming up with answers, especially the day after she went missing, because she was interrogated for 10 long hours. As of July 2022, Lenoria, who would be 30 years old, has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Between 1985 and 1986, three couples were found slain in Washington state and the murders would become known as the Tube Sock Murders. At the time, law enforcement suspected that the case may have been connected to the murders of Edward Smith and Kimberly Diane Levine, a couple from Kent, Washington who were abducted, murdered, and disposed of in a gravel pit near the Columbia River in March 1985, five months earlier. The couple had met and fell in love while both were attending the University of Southeastern Massachusetts in Dartmouth. When they graduated in 1984, they moved to Kent, Washington, and both worked as accountants. They had made plans to travel back to Rentham, Massachusetts to get married in the summer of 1985. However, that day would never come. On Saturday, March 9, 1985, the couple wanted to get away for the weekend and made a plan to travel the three-hour drive to Grant County, Washington on I-90 and explore the beautiful surroundings and well-known tourist landmarks in the area. But something would go horribly wrong. By the next afternoon, Edward's deceased body was discovered in a gravel pit near the Wanapum Dam. Both his hands had been bounded behind his back, and he had a fatal wound to his neck. Kimberly, on the other hand, was nowhere to be found. Their loved ones reported them missing, and two weeks later, their vehicle was found 10 miles away from where Edward's body was found. Upon investigation of the vehicle, one fingerprint was found that did not belong to either couple. Five months later, in August of 1985, skeletal remains were found two miles from where Edward's body had been found. The remains turned out to be those of Kimberly. Four years later, in 1989, that fingerprint was matched to a truck driver by the name of Billy Ray Ballard. He was located already behind bars for an unrelated crime against two women in Wyoming. That same month, 27-year-old Stephen Harkins and his 42-year-old girlfriend, Ruth Cooper, planned a weekend camping trip at Tule Lake in Pierce County. They were living in Tacoma, Washington and working at a local vocational school, and when they didn't arrive back to work on Monday, co-workers became suspicious and their families reported them missing. 
Four days later, hikers passing through Pierce County found Stephen's body near a remote campsite. It appeared that he had been shot while sleeping in his sleeping bag. The couple's dog was found nearby and had been shot to death as well, but there was no sign of Ruth. That fall, a skull was found at the dead end of 8th Avenue South near Hearts Lake, about a mile and a half from where Stephen's body was found. Dental records confirm the skull belonged to Ruth, and two days later, her body and her purse were also found. A tube sock had been tied around her neck, and the autopsy listed her death as homicide. However, authorities later stated that she actually died from a gunshot wound to the stomach. On December 12, 1985, over a month after Ruth was discovered, 36-year-old Mike Reimer, his 21-year-old girlfriend Diana Robertson, and their 2-year-old daughter Crystal left their home in Tacoma, Washington, with a plan to find a campsite near the Nisqually River. Mike was an animal trapper and reportedly planned to check on traps he had set in the area, as well as look for a Christmas tree for the family. Later that evening, customers at a Kmart store 30 miles north of Spanaway found Crystal alone and crying. Only two years old, Crystal was unable to provide information about who brought her to Kmart or where her parents were. Sadly, she did say, however, that mommy was in the trees. The authorities put the stunned little girl in a temporary foster care and spread her picture across the media in the state of Washington. Within two days, Crystal's grandmother, Louise Conrad, saw her picture on a local news broadcast and took custody of her. Police searched the area both on foot and by air, looking for Mike's red 1982 Plymouth pickup truck. It would be over two months later before Diana's body was discovered half buried in snow by a motorist near a logging road off of Washington State Route 7 in Mineral. Bloodhounds scoured the area in the following days, but six inches of snow had fallen and impeded the search. Once the search continued, they found Mike's truck with Diana's body nearby. In the truck, police discovered a manila envelope with I love you, Diana, written on it, later determined to be Mike's handwriting. Bloodstains were also found on the seat of the truck. An autopsy revealed that Diana had been stabbed nearly 20 times and had a tube sock tightly tied around her neck, just as Ruth Cooper did. Because Mike couldn't be found, police speculated that he may have been responsible for Diana's murder and then abandoned their daughter before fleeing. Police also theorized that he may have been responsible for Stephen Harkins and Ruth Cooper's deaths as well. In February 1986, after Diana's body was discovered, the Seattle Post Intelligencer published an article revealing that Mike had been charged with domestic assault against Diana on October 19, 1985. Her sister reported that he had frequently beat on Diana. Therefore, he remained a person of interest for the next 25 years. That is, until March 26, 2011, when hikers discovered a partial human skull, which was later determined to be that of Mike Reimer. It was also found just a mile from where Diana's body had been discovered in 1986. The skull was the only thing found, and the rest of his body still remains missing. Serial killer and trucker Billy Ray Ballard Jr., whose fingerprint was found on Edward Smith and Kimberly Diane Levine's vehicle, confessed to their murders. However, he never confessed to the other murders in which the M.O. was different. The tube socks found around the women's necks resulted in the media dubbing the murders as the tube sock killings. Washington residents have always wondered if another serial killer was on the loose in that area or was Ballard just holding back information because he's a sociopath who loves having control. As of July 2022, the murders of Mike Reimer, Diana Robertson, Stephen Harkins, and Ruth Cooper remain unsolved. Sophia Lucerner Juarez was born February 5, 1998. At the age of four, she was living on the 100 block of East 15th Avenue in Kennewick, Washington with her 20-year-old mother, grandmother, grandmother's boyfriend, her brother, and six aunts and uncles. 
On February 4, 2003, the night before Sophia's fifth birthday, her grandmother's boyfriend left to go to a nearby gas station and asked the kids if they wanted to go with him. Sophia was the only child that wanted to go, but as he was already out the door, he didn't see her and thought she had changed her mind. He then left to drive the five blocks to the gas station. Turns out, Sophia had actually went to ask her mother, Maria, for a dollar bill so she could buy something at the store. Once she had the dollar bill, she left out of the house to catch up with Jose. However, he had already driven off not knowing Sophia was right behind him. Tragically, Sophia would encounter someone evil on the streets that night and would never make it to the store. When Jose returned from the store at 9.45 p.m. and it was discovered that Sophia had not gone with him, Maria called authorities. Sophia was the first child in Washington State that an Amber Alert was released for. A search ensued, but she was never located. Authorities contacted Sophia's alleged father and quickly ruled him out as a suspect. Turns out, he had never even met his daughter and did not even being her father. Jose was also ruled out as a suspect in her disappearance. A 10-year-old relative of Sophia's who lived in her home said he saw her walking down the driveway at about the time she disappeared, accompanied by a man dressed in a black sweatshirt, black pants, and black shoes, but this sighting has never been confirmed. Three months later, authorities announced they were looking for a mid-90s model, full-sized, faded orange van with a license plate which had a double J in the number. The van's driver was a white man with a thick blonde beard between 35 and 40 years old. A witness recalled seeing the van in the area around the time of Sophia's disappearance, but it's unknown if the van is connected to her case. Fast forward 18 years after she went missing, in 2021, investigators said a highly credible witness saw a girl matching Sophia's description walking down the sidewalk on South Washington Street near East 15th Avenue the night she disappeared. The witness stated a young Hispanic boy between 11 and 14 years of age led her away laughing as she was crying. She was reportedly led to a full-sized panel van with occupants. The van was described as light blue, silver, or gray, late 70s or early 80s with no side windows, similar to a work-type van used by painters or builders. It's reported that police kept the suspect's description confidential for 18 years due to active investigations of persons of interest and wanted to avoid that person knowing that they were trying to find them. Police cannot confirm yet if the preteen was working alone or with someone else, but they continue to look for him. Also in 2021, a video surfaced on TikTok of a homeless young woman in Caluacan, Sinaloa, Mexico, that was around the same age as Sofia and had many similarities to Sofia's childhood pictures. She stated that she was kidnapped when she was younger, but didn't think she was Sofia. Authorities were bombarded with this discovery, and over a period of several months and in interviews and legal roadblocks, a DNA test was finally administered, ruling her out as Sophia. Her mother stated she was shy and also believes that Sophia's kidnapper was probably someone Sophia knew and trusted. Sadly, her mother died six years later, in January 2009, of natural causes. She was only 26 years old. As of July 2022, Sophia remains missing and this case remains unsolved. Kelly Diane Wright Sims was born February 24, 1963. At the age of 27, she was a divorced mother of three, living at 807 South 5th Avenue in Kelso, Washington. On October 16, 1990, she spent the evening with friends and her boyfriend playing darts. At 3 a.m., instead of bringing her home, she asked to be dropped off at the corner of Allen Street and South Pacific in South Kelso because she was heading to the Rendezvous Tavern to play pool before picking up her one-year-old son from the babysitters. The walk was only two blocks from where she was dropped off, but she never arrived and hasn't been seen since. Detectives were at one point checking her social security number to see if she might have been working somewhere, but there hasn't been any activity on it. 
This last case has very little information, but after four decades, her family remains very desperate to find her.